She's in the building. We're just waiting for uh, one of our colleagues. She's in the building. We're just waiting for uh, one of our colleagues. Good morning, everybody. My name is David Cooper. Today is the chairman of the Public Waste Authorities Governing Board. Regular meeting for June 19, 2019 at 9 a.m. I'd like to call this meeting to order. Ask the clerk to have a roll call. He's in the building. President. Mr. Weirath? Yes. Mr. White? Yes. Mr. White? Mr. White? Mr. White? Mr. White? Mr. White? Mr. White? Good morning, everybody. We do have a My name is David Cooper. Officially today, we had a forum to have a commissioner of ballot today. The authorities governing board joined us in a regular meeting. The board is Mayor Bernard. Now you with us today. I'd like to call this order. Mr. Cooper, we have a roll call. He's in the building. 
Good morning, everybody. We do have some. My name is David. We have a chair of the House Commission for the Ballast Shake. We are the Joint Lesson Jangler of Meeting. We are the Mayor Bernard. We are the Senator of the Senate. We are the Senator of the Senate. We are the Good morning, everybody. We do have some. My name is David. We have a chair of the House Commission for Ballast Shakes. We are the Governing Board. We are the Senator of the Senate. We are the Senator of the Senate. We are the Senator of the Senate. Yes, we have two channels to the agenda. Item 91. It's the final lease agreement with Verizon. And the lease agreement to reflect the addition of the escalation clause, which was intentionally avoided. Yes, we have uh, two channels to the agenda. Item 91 is the point of disagreement with Verizon. And the lease agreement is supposed to reflect the addition of the escalation clause. And we say goodbye. Item 91. Good morning, everybody. We do have a name for the name of the commission today. We have a name for the commission today. We have a name for the With the same commissioners not present. Uh, agenda item number four, Citizens Advisory Committee, June 5th, 2018. <coughs> uh, receive and file. So moved. Second. Motion by Commissioner McKinley, second by Commissioner Weinroth. All in favor, all opposed. Passes 5-0. On to the recommended consent agenda, agenda, agenda item five. Would any commissioner like to pull an agenda item from the consent agenda? Um, without any commissioner wanting to pull anything, were there any comments or concerns from our uh, director? None. Okay. We have a motion by C Commissioner Weiss. Second by Commissioner McKinley. All in favor, all opposed. Consent agenda item five passes five zero. Agenda item number six, matters by the public. I presently have only one card here before me. We will accept cards uh, if anyone is waiting to turn that in. None? All right, I'd like to call to the dais for agenda item nine. Is this 92? I apologize, there's no matters by the public. On to agenda item number seven, public hearing workshop proposed budget fiscal year 2019-2020. We've all had an opportunity uh, to review this. We've had our ability to put our input into it. I'm very proud of the budget that's been presented by our professional staff as they always do an incredible job. And thank you for all of your efforts. Uh, I do not have any comments from the public on this, on this matter. Uh, so I'll turn it over to uh, my colleagues. <clears throat> would you like a presentation from staff? Yes, we would love a presentation. All right, uh, Mr. Dumars will start it off, and Christina Richards, who is our budget administrator, will present the budget. Yes, good morning, Mr. Chair and other board members. Uh, staff, we're pleased to 
I present this fiscal year 2020 proposed budget for your consideration. And um, when we have completed this presentation, we'll be asking the board to approve the proposed budget to approve the assessment and tip fee rates for the required notice and to continue this public hearing until August 28, 2019. And with that, the budget manager, Christine Richards, will make the presentation. Wonderful, Ms. Richards, you're recognized. Thank you, Mr. DeMars. Good morning, Chairman, Governing Board members. Could you just pull it a little bit closer? closer. And members of the public, my name is Christina Richards, Budget Manager for the Solid Waste Authority, and I've prepared a brief summary of the fiscal year 2020 proposed highlights and changes since the 2019 adopted budget. Since 2019, there was no increase to the residential or commercial load disposal assessment rates and only slight increases in government assessment rates of 1.5%, commercial medium of 0.5%, and commercial high of 0.7%. For 2020, there's an annual reduction of 5 million due to the su successful retirement of the authority's 2008 banknote. Tipping fee revenue is up $2.2 million, and electric sales revenue is up $2.1 million. Plant operations expenses are up by $5.5 million due to contractual increases. Operating expenses are up slightly about 1.2%, and that includes a COLA of 2.11%. The blighted grant program remains at 500,000 for 2020. The total capital improvement program is up at up 1.5 million from 2019 and includes a landfill escrow requirement of 2 million. Mandatory collections include the new franchise hauler contracts and service areas that take effect in fiscal year 2020 beginning October 1st. And staff is requesting four new FTEs. Those include an EBO outreach specialist to enhance the new EBO office's outreach to vendors, a service area coordinator to manage the new service area six, a programmer analyst to configure and support the authority's new scale software management system, and a hydrogeologist too to handle the increasing demands of the authority's hydrogeological projects and compliance. The estimated cost for these four new positions is currently built in and it's about 336,000, including all estimated employer paid benefits. So here's the summary of the 2019 adopted versus the 2020 proposed budgets for disposal and mandatory collection rates. As mentioned, there was no increase to the residential or commercial low disposal assessment rates and only the slight increases to the government assessments of 1.5% or $2 a year. Medium generators like office buildings of 0.5% or about a dollar per 1,000 square feet a year. And high generators like restaurants of about 0.7% or about $7 per 1,000 square feet a year along with the mandatory collection rates, which include the new franchise hauler contract details. So staff is requesting the approval of the proposed budget, the assessment and tip fee rates for the trim notice and to continue the public hearing until August 28th, 2019. And with that, are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Richards. Thank you, Ms. Richards, for that a very articulate presentation on a very important item to the public. Do I have any Questions from commissioners. Commissioner Weiss, you're recognized. Uh, thank you, Vice Mayor. Um, question, uh, with uh, the uh, sal proposed salary increases for staff, um, so can you just review what that is, what you're, what you're recommending? Yes, I'll address that. Um, what our program here that was adopted by the board at the end of 2014, 2015 is a COLA merit-based program. Um, so the COLA is based on an index, uh, a CPI index at 2.11%. 2.11%. In addition to that, the employees receive a merit uh, increase based on their annual reviews, and the average merit increase uh, is 2.15%. Uh, 
based upon that. So if you add the two of those together, it's between uh, a little, little more than 4%. Okay, thank you. And then the other question, you know, and I don't know how applicable this is to the Solid Waste Authority, but in our budget that we uh, are uh, in process for the county, um, we're ensuring that every, uh, all the employees have a minimum of $15 an hour uh, wages. And where, where are we at in the Solid Waste Authority in that uh, regard? That was brought to my attention. I've um, contacted our HR staff. We only have one employee that makes less than $16 an hour, and we will incorporate that if that's the board's direction, that policy over here as well. Uh, do, um, Commissioner Weinroth, are your comments related to us raising that one position? Are there any objections? Can we give staff direction to raise that to a minimum $15 an hour? Uh, direction will be so provided, uh, Mr. Executive Director. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up, Commissioner Weiss. Thank Weiss. you. Ms. Commissioner Weinroth, do you recognize, sir? Yeah, um, just a comment. I see that the uh, the revenues are going up for electrical generation. How are we as far as our capacity on the electrical generation? Uh, we are doing very well. We are, um, our capacity factors are very high. Um, we are very safe in our contract with Florida Power and Light, and um, everything is, is at both plants are operating uh, very, very well. So uh, we're well above the level of compliance necessary with our contracts. Great, thank you. And Mr. Dumars or to Ms. Richards, whoever is, um, I'm gonna point this to Mr. Dumars because we've discussed it in person. Can you give us and the public just a little bit of background on how you were able to structure the retirement of the debt to save the Solid Waste Authority and the tax assessment payers $5 million in this, in this budget cycle? In our general reserve fund, we had enough money there and also a balance after taking out about $32 million to retire that debt. And so with recommendations from the um, financial risk manager and all, I'm sorry, not the risk manager, the financial manager, uh, we decided to go ahead and take that out. We realized in the future we would alleviate that $5 million annually. So that's the process that we used. Well, we appreciate the proactivity uh, on issues like that. It obviously bears um, a lot of fruit for our assessment payers and taxpayers. And um, having good credit, ability to access credit, and having strong reserves, I know, assists in that. And so we appreciate your leadership on, um, on those issues in general. I don't have any comment cards on... Um, Agenda, <coughs> excuse me, agenda item number seven, the proposed budget for fiscal year 1920. Move but approval of proposed budget. We have a motion by Commissioner Weinroth to move approval on agenda item seven one, which is to approve the proposed budget, approve the assessment and tip fee rates for the required trim notice, and continue the public hearing until August 28th, 2019. Do I have a second? Second. Second by Commissioner Weiss. Any discussion? Commissioner McKinley, you're recognized. Thank you, uh, Chairman, and I want you to know I just took a picture of you with your FSU oh, cup, so it's on record. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Commissioner, I didn't want any more friction between my wife and I. That's I an inside joke. There again. <laughs> I was hoping Commissioner Mayor Bernard would be here for that one. I, I'm not. I'm not. It's, I'm not going there. Um, I think I've been pretty clear. Um, in previous votes about my concerns about the rates for uh, one of the areas in, in my district, particularly in the acreage. Um, but I, and, and I've gone on record, I have voted against those rate increases. Uh, I will support the budget today, uh, knowing that those rate increases are in there, but the rest of the budget that you have presented to us is pretty phenomenal. And I appreciate what you've done for the employees I appreciate, Mr. Dumars, what you've done to restructure the debt to save the taxpayers' money. What I would like to see, uh, if there is any opportunity, you know, if we have to make any budget adjust adjustments because we're doing better than we thought, I would like to see a priority given to those revenues going into the blighted grant program. Uh, one of the biggest needs, and I'm s certain in all of our districts, uh, particularly in the glades, and I'm sure in areas of Lake Worth and West Palm, Riviera Beach, is the need for demolition dollars. And uh, as we start to face more cuts to CDBG, which is another program we use to provide those types of grants, 
we've got a pretty creative program here that can help those communities. We learned yesterday from the property appraiser that property values in the uh, Tri-Cities out in the grade, particularly Belgrade and Pahokee, they went up 5% last year, uh, which is the first time that's happened in a while. And I have to believe it's because we've gone in and cleaned up those communities and improved the infrastructure. And part of the cleanup has been as a result of the grants that we've been able to provide them from the Solid Waste Authority. So if we have, uh, you know, our revenues proceed or uh, exceed projections, I'd like priority to be given to that program. Thank you. Okay. From, uh, to the executive director, the, the, um, the fund or revenue source for the grant program that we've instituted, can you explain that? Yes, the yeah. primary revenue source, the revenue source for those funds is the supplemental waste income from the waste being brought in from outside the county. Um, it's about 110,000 tons a year. We do generate revenue. Um, to Commissioner McKinley's uh, question, we do have, um, between now and August, a lot of changes happen typically in this period. New units come online. Um, if it's the board's wish to um, increase that funding for the Bloody Grant Program, um, I'm very confident we can find a way to make that happen, so. But it would not, probably would not be from the same revenue source. I would uh, suspect that that's going to be declining in, in outer years. Uh, that will be declining in outer years. Um, we've probably got another four or five years uh, under that program, given the way the waste stream is growing, so it shouldn't be a short-term issue. Um, but we do have the ability um, between now and August to take a look at some things, if, if that's the board's wish. Is it Commissioner McKinley's wish that these changes be considered in this fiscal year? Okay. Um, on, on that, yes, sir, Commissioner Weiss? No, no, I agree. Okay. Um, what I, I certainly think we all agree that it's a very positive program. Certainly cities and areas within my district have accessed it, and you all have supported their requests, which I appreciate. Of course, uh, an increase in that grant program would require um, some unique discussion with the uh, with some notice in the board president I think full complement of the board so is it possible that we have that discussion and give direction at the august. in the august meeting yes absolutely okay. and I'm sure that was Commissioner McKinley's intent and so it doesn't look like there's any objections to having that discussion um, did we uh, did we vote yet all right there was a Motion pending by Commissioner Weinroth, seconded by Commissioner Weiss. <laughs> you can say yes, Clerk. You can back me up. All right. Um, all in favor? All opposed? Agenda item 7 1 passes unanimously 5 to 0. Move on to old business, agenda item number 8. Uh, let me just go back to 7 real quick. Thank you again. I know that the board's expressed their appreciation. Um, there we can't give words proper enough to express our appreciation on behalf of our constituents for the great work that the authority does on this issue and in general. On to agenda nine, number eight, old business, none. Number nine, new business, 9A, executive director, status of recycling in Palm Beach County. Uh, before we get to the executive director, I'm going to recognize Commissioner Weinroth. Thank you. Um, and to the executive director, I know that we had some pre-meeting uh, discussion about your presentation coming up. And I'd like to ask you if we could keep this down to about 30 minutes so that, uh, you know, I, d I don't want to uh, tax my, uh, my fellow board members here. We will do that. I've instructed the staff already to try and keep it moving. So, um, Mr. Weinroth's anti-tax. We know. We get right. it. <laughs> so what we've um, got for you today is a, is a presentation on the status of the recycling program in Palm Beach County. There's been a lot in the news recently um, regarding uh, recycling, and so I think it's it's I think it's there's value to it. Sometimes taking a step back and and looking at where you are, and this is an opportunity to do that, not just for your benefit, but also for the benefit of the public that we serve. Um, so today, um, it's going to be kind of a team effort in between myself, uh, Mr. Willie Puzz, and Mr. Romana Carey. Um, so we'll try to keep this thing moving. Um, just to start off, um, we're going to discuss a little bit about the origin and development of recycling in Palm Beach County, uh, the status of the international recycling markets, which are impacting everyone uh, nationwide, um, the specific status of the SWA's recycling program. We'll look at some historic historical volume and pricing by each commodity. Um, we'll provide an, uh, a 
quick uh, cur calculation of current average cost per household of the program, and we'll look at some uh, financial impacts of, of some adjustments that, that could be made um, to the program um, if the board decided they wanted to do that. Um, and the industry's reaction to the current market conditions and what the future outlook is for recycling in general. Um, you are all aware of, in the interest of keeping this moving, of who we are. We are a governmental agency. We're very much like a utility um, because we, we operate based on a, uh, basically based on a rate study. We are an enterprise program. All of our revenues are derived by user fees or uh, byproduct revenues of the system. Uh, recycling is, a, um, our objective is to provide value to our rate payers while satisfying our mandate. Uh, recycling is a focus and has been a focus of the authority's integrated solid waste management system since 1989. Uh, integrated solid waste management can be viewed simply as an upside down triangle with uh, recycling and reuse at the top and landfilling at the bottom. Uh, the purpose of integrated solid waste management is to basically uh, put as little in the landfill as possible. Uh, recycling is consistent with the state's goals, and recycling and resource recovery are specifically mentioned in the Authority's Special Act. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Puzz. Hello, Commissioners. Moving forward with the origin and development of recycling in Palm Beach County, this may be a refresher for many of the commissioners that have sat here longer, um, but maybe new to those new to the dais. So the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County was created by a special act in 1975. That special act outlined source re, uh, recovery and recycling. Um, fast forward to 1988, the state established the Solid Waste Management Act that established a 30% recycling goal uh, by 1994. And it also identified the Fab Five items for recycling that the counties needed to focus on. So our recycling program started as pilot programs in 1988. We established a countywide program in 1992. And as Dan mentioned, we did waste generation studies in 1993 and 1996 for commercial and residential respectively to account for those changes. Hopefully you know that we do have a dual stream program here in Palm Beach County. The carts in the back of the picture are for multifamily communities. The small 18 gallons and the 25 gallon bin in the middle is for residential. Paper is in the yellow, containers is in the blue. So in 2008, there was an expansion in recycling with the Energy, Climate Change, and Economic Security Act that passed. That's where we have the 75% recycling goal by 2020, and also waste to energy was including in that. And that red block box that you can see there is the outline that says by the year 2020, to reduce the amount of recyclable solid waste going into landfills or incineration facilities by 75%, so that was the goal back then. If I could just inquire regarding that aspirational goal to be met in 2020 from a statewide collective standpoint, how does it look? From a statewide perspective, uh, I believe we're shy, and I know that the state is looking at that and, and what that can ultimately mean going forward. But from a Palm Beach County perspective, we do have a slide that addresses that. We are just shy of that 75, and you'll see that in detail a little bit further in the presentation. Okay, thank you. So whenever we were siting for a uh, second waste energy facility, um, the power plant siting certificate requirements required us to have a, a material separation plan and required that plan to be vetted with the public and formulated into a formal plan and adopted by the public as well. So the status of international markets. So in 2013, this is a little bit of a flashback. China implemented one of their first policies on recycling, and that was Operation Green Fence. And they ultimately started looking at all of the incoming material for contamination. They were looking at their inspectors on the docks to make sure that they were operating efficiently and up to par. And the impact that that had to SWA was very minimal. Uh, and we did have some revenue impacts at that time. And we'll have some slides further in that shows some of that revenue impact. Last year, China implemented their national sword policy. That's where they banned 23 different uh, wastes going into China. And they also imposed a half a percent contamination limit on all paper products going into China, recycled paper. And why that's important is because the industry standard for fiber for paper going in is about uh, between three to five percent. So even the cleanest recycling programs to try and get that three to five percent to a half a percent is very challenging. 
So how that impacted the Solid Waste Authority of Palm Beach County, we did have some disruptions industry-wide, and where that's really hitting us is in the revenues, and we'll see that in slides further down. So what National Sword did is China still needs recyclable material. And what they've done is created, try to create their own domestic market for recycling. So as internationally, prices for recyclable commodities are on a downward trend. Um, China's cardboard market internally is $300 per ton. So China's doing, for their domestic market, is doing fabulous. However, everybody else is suffering because of what China is trying to do. And one of the things that is very interesting for here is that you've seen probably some of the headlines and things. Many of the communities are scaling back or discontinuing their recycling programs. We're going to talk about that a little bit later. Um, and you also see a lot of Chinese companies investing in either U.S. markets or other international markets to help create that um, uh, flow and keep the material going so it can get to China. So we're seeing intermediate steps pop up. Now we're going to turn it over to Mr. Ramanakari. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair and board members. I'll be providing an update on uh, historical volumes and pricing. Um, basically, uh, next slide, please. So we process about 90,000 tons every year. Uh, it's basically the blue bin and yellow bin materials. And uh, the RMPF has been operating since 2009. We built that at a cost of uh, 43 million approximately. And over the past two years, inventories have been high, but uh, we're still able to move the materials. Next slide, please. So what are our challenges? Basically, there are seven grades of plastic, like you see everything from uh, PETE and HDP, and those number ones and twos are the high value materials, and everything from three to seven it's not as desirable. Um, we don't recycle everything, uh, but people think you know many things are recyclable, and uh, there's a lot of confusion out there. And um, especially when we have a seasonal residents who are here uh, a few months in the year, and uh, they kind of adopt their programs from where they come from. And, and if I may inquire, um, th there is an efficiency cost, I assume, that the authority has to deal with when improper material materials are inserted into the bins is that fair to say it's correct it lowers the commodity pricing um, even though we have specifications that need to be met but uh, you know I mean that's one of the big issues driving the industry um, like I said you know commodity markets fluctuate and so our revenues are mostly uh, dependent on that and there's also technological changes in the industry that you know we're trying to see you know from a cost benefit perspective next slide please uh, this slide that Mr. Puss was referring to, the state goal uh, back in 2010, um, the legislature passed House Bill 7135 and established a 75% recycling goal to be achieved by 2020. Uh, like you see from the chart there, you are very close to achieving that. Uh, the red bars that you see are the waste to energy credits that the state uh, provided since 2012. So if not for those credits, you know, uh, the traditional recycling alone doesn't meet uh, what's required to uh, achieve that goal. So the three biggest commodities here are newsprint um, and uh, mixed paper and glass. Um, and glass is uh, pretty much a zero revenue commodity and we get a lot of that. Next slide, please. Uh, this is uh, basically the processing fees that we have since 2018. 2018, a blended rate of $53 per ton and it's up to 91 for the upcoming contract. So we run the residential fiber lines at 30 tons per hour, uh, commercial fiber lines at 15 tons per hour, and containers at 15 tons per hour as well. And what's driving this increase is basically um, a change in minimum wage requirements we incorporated into the contract. Uh, currently, Florida minimum wage is $8.46, and we are changing it to uh, $12.62 effective 1st of October, which is the Palm Beach County minimum living wage. So certainly that's not the state's minimum wage. That's a policy decision that the county government leaders have made. That's correct. Um, uh, commodities, um, as you see from here, um, old newspaper number eight was the biggest commodity back in 09, but uh, the trend of newspapers uh, 
just gone down. You know, fiscal year 18, it's uh, the least volume commodity here, and that's basically consumer behavior, not buying newspapers and reading uh, uh, news from, um, you know, handhelds and portables. Again, this is uh, the overall commodity in tons. You see a declining trend there. That's the blue bars, and the green line that you see is the revenue per ton. We're basically at, you know, all-time lows here. And, and the trend line you see is for the tonnage. Uh, again, you know, um, old newspaper number eight, uh, it's a declining trend. And uh, back in 2015, the board approved marketing this material as a premium mix because the market specifications were changing. And um, so since then, you know, we've been marketing this material as premium mix. And uh, cardboard is a steady performer. Uh, again, you know, tonnages have been okay and pricing um, is steady. A mixed paper, uh, last year the board approved a minimum $20 floor price for this, and uh, we were right at the bottom right there. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, these are containers. You know, there's one commodity that we left out, uh, that's glass, because, you know, it kind of skews the scale. That's about uh, 18 to 20,000 tons. So it doesn't show all the materials. Um, so uh, on the next slide, you know, I'll provide you an update on that one. What do you see in here is steady tonnage for aluminum. I'll go into a little bit of detail why, you know, steady tonnage is good as far as this material is concerned and pricing have been okay. So uh, this is one of the most valuable commodities we process at RMPF. Uh, PET is also a valuable commodity. Uh, this closely correlates uh, crude oil prices because it's a petroleum-based product. Tonnages have been steady in the uh, last couple of years. We've been getting good pricing on this. Commissioner McKinley, you recognized. Can you, uh, this one, polyethylene terra. Terry Thalley. Yeah, could you give us an example of what kind of container that is? <laughs> okay, I mean, that's basically your water bottles. If you see the top of the chart here on the top right, you know, we have oh, a picture for okay. each commodity, and that's your water bottles. I had the same question, and I, I have the printed version. That's, it's a water bottle. And colleagues, please feel free to interject and ask questions without having to be recognized by the chair. Okay, aluminum cans, back in 1988, um, uh, each pound of aluminum produced 23 um, soda cans. Uh, in 2012, um, it's 31. The same for plastic water bottles. Each pound of plastic produced 31 bottles, and now it's 49. So just to relate this to um, our operation here, uh, 800 tons of aluminum was the average that you saw in the previous chart. So for our tonnage, back in 1988, that would have been 37 million soda cans. And in 2012, it's close to 50 million. And that's the change we're dealing with. And uh, same for PET. Um, back in 2009, uh, 3,500 tons of PET, which is the average here, would have produced 217 million uh, water bottles. And now the same tonnage produces 343 million. So it's not just the tonnage. You know, the tonnage have been steady or slightly decreasing. But the number of pieces you have that you need to sort, it's been increasing by almost 50%. And so has there been a concerted effort by corporations to reduce the amount of packaging and the raw material that goes into each and every product, you know, it's less now. Uh, whether it's water bottles, you know, you, you might have noticed that, you know, I mean, you can crush the water bottle, you know, 10 years ago, it was pretty sturdy. <laughs> I'm sure you are, sir. Um, Commissioner Kerner's water bottle. It's strong. knee boarding, actually, but anyways, what's that, Commissioner? We had a water bottle today as well. Yeah, that's a uh, service tumblers. We could recycle all those, but is, is that is that driven by I'm sure um, environmental concerns along with reducing the, the cost to package. It, it's both, you know, it's operating costs, you know, it's shipping costs, and uh, using less material and being uh, you know green. So I mean, it checks all the boxes for them. But at the same time, Americans are consuming and using more. Yes, there's more consumption of soda and water and everything. So, I mean, it's not the tonnage, you know, it's the number of units to sell. Right. And that has increased by close to 50%. Wow. Do you think it's, it's also due to, um, you know, consumer behavior? Yes. Of, of knowing to recycle things? Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I guess, if you don't mind, uh, the other question I had was, w with some of these plastics, w um, and with glass and, pot and pot glass, would it be better for them to put that in their garbage and have it burned? 
uh, glass. Or, uh, glass. I don't think glass burns. No, I mean, not glass. You know, I mean, it is an option, but uh, Mr. Pelowitz is going to cover that uh, for Sorry. a few slides down. So. Uh, okay. I got ahead of you. Uh, next slide. This is your HDP colored. Uh, basically, you know, these are uh, opaque uh, detergent cans that you see there. Uh, again, you know, tonnage is steady and pricing is slightly inching up, um, close to $400 a ton. Uh, this is a petroleum-based product again, so it correlates with the oil prices. And the natural... Uh, do, do we sell through brokers or do we have direct buyers? We, we market it, you know, we sell it through brokers and other outlets, you know, so I mean, it's bid on a monthly basis. Um, so we get the best pricing every month. Okay, thank you. Uh, this is HDP natural, again, the same trend, uh, petroleum based product, uh, slightly increasing trend on pricing. Glass, you know, this is the worst performing commodity with high volumes. You know, as you see, it's about 17,000 tons per year, but our revenues are zero. But we're still moving the material, and some uh, uh, entities are having issues with moving this material. What's that mean? How does the revenue zero? Because they, they um, take the material for free. We don't get any revenue. And there are, there are other outlets that are paying um, I mean, entities that are paying the outlets um, five, ten dollars a ton to take it away. Yeah, you're not to you're take not, it away. Yeah, you're not. Co there's no cost to get rid of it. Wow. I mean, so it's a good deal to not to give it away for yes, free. Yes, you know, I mean, we're doing better than uh, obviously it's zero, but we're still doing better than other entities, you know, that have to pay to uh, move the material. Okay. And there are times when you know we've used glass to um, um, construct landfill roads and stuff. We we crushed the glass because there were, there were a couple of months when uh, the, the pricing was negative. Basically, we had to pay to move the material, and we said no, and we could put the material to good use beneficially, and we processed the glass and used that for landfill road construction and uh, used it as a drainage material also. Um, this is commodity plastics one through seven. As I said before, uh, ones and twos are better. Uh, the pets and HDPE, anything else, uh, um, it's not a high value product. So what they do is, you know, they sell it based on um, everything bailed together. And um, so the outlets that buy, they process this further to separate the ones and twos, or uh, there are other entities that use this to produce uh, fuel oil by pyrolysis. And for example, in 2000, in FY18, there's a zero there. Yes, market was down, you know, it's slightly picking up now. And this is all like, you know, again, uh, green fence and national sword, and those are the effects that you see. Wow, yeah, wow. The next category I have is aseptic. These are um, on the juice boxes and milk cartons and stuff, and uh, again, it's a declining trend. Sometimes they use this to uh, reprocess and uh, you know get the fiber out of this material, and that's how they use it. And with that, uh, I turn it over to Mr. Palowitz. Yes. Um, so I've got the uh, the joy of the dry part of it, which is to talk about the, the financials. Um, what we've tried to do here is come up with a with a simple um, countywide calculation, average cost per household basis of what recycling actually costs. Um, I think it's good to go through this because there are, uh, I think a lot of people in the public still uh, may believe that recycling makes money or, or that it, it's a big revenue generator for the authority. Recycling actually is, is, is fairly expensive. There are costs associated with it. Um, so looking at it, uh, this first slide, um, FY 2020 recycling costs, um, the cost of recycling collection is the biggest component of, of recycling when you look at it. Um, this is basically taking our, our average, weighted average collection costs that will be in place on October 1 and uh, imputing that countywide, um, just as an average. So you're looking at about $25 million a year for the cost of recycling collection, that is running the truck, picking up those blue and yellow bins. Um, you also have uh, the cost of the, uh, the recovered materials recycling facility operation and some authority internal costs associated with our recycling and public education programs um, that, that we manage as well. Um, that's about $11 million a year, including the, the O&M cost on the facility. And then finally, you have the revenues that offset those costs of about $4.5 million. It should be noted that the revenues 
at, at some times have been two and a half times that. So it, it's been much better. We're at the bottom basically right now. So on an average uh, household basis, cost per household, you're looking at about $3.91 a month um, for the recycling programs that the authority runs. Um, it's not inexpensive, it's not overly expensive, um, but that's what you're looking at. Uh, we have heard on multiple times there's questions about, well, can you burn it? Can you actually generate electricity from these materials? And the answer to that is, is yes, you can. Um, so what we've tried to do is put together uh, some financial analysis here of what the impact would be in the short term of diverting recycling to the waste energy plant, for example, as one option. So the first two numbers you'll recognize, they're the same as up above. Um, again, you would save um, on your collection costs, you would um, save on the cost of operating your recycling facility, but you'd lose some revenue from the recycling program. You'd also lose some electric revenue because the glass that goes into the boilers is not gonna generate electricity. Um, so that would impact you there. You would lose the revenue from the supplemental waste program because we would eff effectively re be replacing supplemental waste with these recyclables. And um, naturally, if you're moving recycling to the garbage stream, there's gonna be an increased cost on the garbage collection side. So we've calculated that based on a straight line uh, calculation based on what those garbage rates are. So in the theoretical case where you could today just say we're going to cut it off and we're going to divert it to the waste energy plant, all other things being equal, and there are a lot of other, th other scenario, other things involved in that, you could save the average household about $2.95 a month in doing it that way. Um, that's the situation now with supplemental waste. The next slide is the, the one that's up on your screen right now. You know, a couple years from now, um, the waste stream in Palm Beach County is gonna grow to the point where we can no longer accept waste from outside the county. We do um, process vegetative waste in the waste energy plant. So the next step in this process is to be diverting vegetative waste out of the waste energy plant to make room for garbage. That's basically the plan. So if you had to, rather than foregoing the supplemental waste revenue, you're incurring the cost of processing the vegetation that you're diverting from the plant, um, our current cost based on contracts is about $30 a ton. So For um, vegetative waste to be transported? To be processed, processed. an off-site processor, yes. Um, so under that scenario, and that was, would be like the situation five years from now, <coughs> um, the savings would be $2.85 a month per household if you could do that. Again, all other things being equal. You There's can't just unwind contracts, and you can't just, the cities all have their own collection contracts. The cities would all have to agree to do it. I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, so, th you know, there are a lot of other moving parts here, but this is just for the purpose of, of this discussion. So um, just to, to back up a little bit and give you an idea what the assumptions were, the analysis is countywide, assumes all the municipalities adopt the change, um, almost 700,000 households, 72,000 tons of residential recyclables. We're assuming that the commercial would go the commercial sector is a private sector uh, uh, market, so we're assuming that would go somewhere else. Uh, the collection costs are based on what our costs are, and all of the revenues and expenses are based on the FY20 budget, which you just saw. So what are other considerations associated with recycling? Uh, first, the authority's collection contracts, which the board just approved and we just entered into, run through 2026, and recycling is included in those contracts. Um, so if you were going to make a change, I guess the ideal time to do it would have been before these contracts went on the street. Um, so that's 2026. Um, the ability to make any changes in the middle of that contract is going to be subject to negotiation, the outcome of which is, is uncertain. Um, the SWA has a capital investment in the facility the, down the street on 45th Street of about $43 million. Uh, it's an extensive investment, and that facility has the capacity to handle uh, Palm Beach County's recyclables for a very, very long time. So um, it's a great asset that we have. The state does have a 2020 recycling goal of 75%. We're just shy of it. Um, the state is currently looking at that recycling goal and, and potentially making some changes to it. Um, while we're very close to achieving the goal, uh, much of the state is, is, I would say, not quite so close. So there's a question as to how realistic that goal is, the way it's currently formulated. Um, there would be impacts on the waste energy plant associated with putting glass in the boilers. Um, it will increase maintenance cost. It does lower electrical output, and it could increase downtime at the facility. Much of this, much of this glass would ultimately end up in the landfill at the end because it's 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 going to be in the it's going to be in the ash, and it's going to end up in the landfill, or it's going to come out in the front end processing, 
at the uh, REF number one. Uh, plastics in the boilers can increase emissions, but the levels are well below our permitted limits. That really wouldn't be a big issue. I will point out, though, the plastics are one of our better financial performers, as you saw on the charts. They're actually not, haven't been impacted one and two as much as uh, the fiber has been. Um, so it is one of our better, uh, our better uh, uh, commodities. As I said, there will likely be additional costs associated with trying to make these changes, and one of those may be the need to do a new generation study because if the garbage stream increases, that's what we based our assessment rates on, and you may need to go back and redo that uh, generation study. Um, it's just, uh, it'd be an administrative cost. It'd probably be between uh, one and two million dollars to do it. Um, other, co other considerations associated with decreasing recycling and uh, or just continuing recycling, and this goes back to what our primary mission is, is, is as an integrated sol solid waste management entity. Uh, the renew renewable energy facility number two will be a capacity about five years sooner, which means you're going to have some excess garbage that you're going to have to find something to do with uh, five years sooner. Uh, presumably, that would end up in the landfill, and doing so would reduce your landfill life by about three years, which means you pushes you three years closer to having to make another decision about what you're going to do about adding capacity. Which the capacity um, projection right now is pretty far out. 2049 currently is the current projection. 2046 would be where um, we project it would be if we eliminated recycling and moved it into the waste energy plant. Um, and my guess is given the cost uh, and the difficulty of developing new infrastructure like this, there would be a time if we were not recycling where the issue of recycling in order to avoid doing this would come up again in the future. So um, I just want to put that out there as a as a note, we know that once that comes, some difficult decisions are going to have to be made about uh, shipping waste to foreign land, to distant landfills is extraordinarily expensive. Um, we just ran some quick numbers. If we had to do it for that three-year period, you're looking at about $150 million in just shipping to th that excess garbage to another landfill somewhere based on, uh, oh, and uh, Commissioner Berger has arrived. Um, so um, that warranty. What would that come out to? On a, uh, well, right now, uh, let's just say it's $50 million a year. Um, that's about, uh, based on our current uh, budget numbers, about a million dollars is a dollar on the single family rate. It'd be about $50 a year added to the single family rate in those years where you would have to do it. As opposed to the $3 cost we're saying right now for the recycling. Right, exactly, right now. So, and that's what my next slide is about here. It's, imp it's important to note that every, every disposal option has a cost. And recycling is, I know we don't call it that, is a disposal option. Um, it is not without cost. So when you look at um, the numbers in front of you, this is, uh, these are full cost numbers done based on a, a component cost summary, full cost analysis I've been doing here since about 1991. Um, it's kind of dry, but this gives you the average cost of these four different um, uh, disposal options at the authority right now are facilities as of 2017. Um, these are full costs. They include owning and operating, uh, principal interest on debt, all of that. Um, landfill cost is just under $22. Net of the electricity sales? Yes, all of them, all of these costs are net of whatever byproduct revenues are generated at wow. the facility. Um, question for you is, I mean, one of the things, when you talk about costs, so you're, you're talking about the, the costs of, of the authority, but there's, there's additional costs um, for these items. I mean, there's a cost to, you know, extract um, or continue to extract um, oil uh, from, you know, from, from the ground or from the planet that this, in fact, replaces. I mean, there, there are non-tangible costs. I mean, they're, they're actually tangible. I guess somebody could actually do the study and figure it out. But there's a cost. Um, ultimately, um, to not to not re to not have these materials available and be able to reuse them, and so I think that, and I don't know where that fits in, but I mean I think in, at some point it need you know you need we need to look at the totality of this. I mean obviously from just from the operations of the of the of the waste authority, I understand what we're saying, but I think it, there's a there's a much bigger discussion to be had about this about these materials and the ultimate value of, of being able to reutilize them. But, but I, th I think a lot of the, I can't imagine the actuarial studies that would have to go on to kind of determine 
a lot of the variables that you're discussing, but I think a lot of that's borne by the consumer at the end of the day um, versus the cost to dispose it. Is that a fair? I mean, if, you know, as, as uh, you know, fossil fuels run out, right? And we can't, plastic bottles are derived from fossil fuels, if I understand correctly. That's correct, yes. And as it becomes more limited, the cost of the consumer to purchase that bottle of water will go up um, to some degree that will be factored into the price, but the disposal side of it, I guess, is also affected by that, and I guess that's the point that you're making, but what a, what a difficult it analysis is. it is. It is, but I mean, it, it, it makes it, it, you know, at some point in the discussion, I mean, when you're looking at, you know, sort of global policy on these materials, you know, because there is a cost, there is a dispo there are actual dipo disposal costs, but then there's additional costs beyond that. Yes, that is correct. And what we talk about here and what we see in a lot of the industry uh, presentations is this concept of the circular economy. Um, that is where you, where products are generated, products are used, products are put back into some recycling process and then used to produce new products that then make their way back into the economy. Um, it is true that nearly uni universally that using recycled product consumes less resources, produces less pollution, uh, uh, uses less energy, and is ultimately more efficient than using uh, virgin materials uh, once and then disposing of them. So that's kind of the whole background on recycling. My point in putting this um, up is there are some incremental, when you look at incremental cost versus full cost, um, on a short-term basis, your costs are incremental. Uh, in a long-term basis, uh, those incremental costs approach full cost. So while we do have some economies today that would allow movement of material from, say, the re recycling side to the waste energy side, over the long term, you do have to develop that capacity to handle it regardless of how you handle it and the cost of doing that approach is full cost, uh, not, it's not uh, variable cost or incremental. So that's just pointing that out. Um, obviously, we, our objective here primarily is preserving landfill space. What we talk about is, is landfill minimization here, most of anything. Um, you'll see that with the future item, with an item that's coming up on the agenda. Um, so that's really why we do it and why we've done it. But I do think it's important to go through these just to understand, you know, in more detail, what recycling is and what it entails, but you are right, it's from our standpoint here, obviously our numbers, we don't have the sophistication to be able to calculate what the global benefit or cost is of recycling uh, PET bottles, for example. And uh, as we get in, I think, is this the end of the presentation? No, we've got a, a little more to go, um, but we're gonna get there pretty quickly, <laughs> so. Well, I, I have a question. Um, I have a lot of questions, and there were some assumptions made that you, you know the new members of the of the authority will probably benefit from this more than some of us that have been here a little bit longer. I've been blown away by what I've learned today, so um, thank you for bringing this up, Commissioner Weinroth. Uh, I just wanted to go back to a question from a couple slides ago: the, the aspirational goal of the state, 75 percent. What what are there credits? Are there incentives, or is it just the lawmakers doing what they normally do? So yeah. Um, to answer your question. Um, back in the day, uh, you know, 90s, there used to be, there was a recycling grant, and it was attached to achievement under this program. And over time, that recycling grant was eliminated. And so there is no money anymore. The incentive used to be money. Um, there isn't any more. Um, but the requirement is placed on the counties to achieve the, the recycling goal. That's in, the, in 403, is, is that the counties are given a responsibility to achieve the goal. Um, there is no, however, there are no, there's no teeth in it right now. There's no penalties. No, there's no penalties. It's just an aspirational goal. The only, uh, I guess, they have the bully pulpit and they have the ability to post the numbers every year and show you how bad you're doing relative to everybody else. But other than that, um, that's all it's there. Well, okay. within, and that, that's the <coughs> point that I wanted to make is we're a large county, both in area and, and resource and in population. And we've borne some capital costs for REF1 and RAF2 and R the RMPF that we're able to access because of the wealth and population of our county that most other counties, financially constrained counties, couldn't even probably get an effective recycling program together because of the capital costs involved with the, the main, you know, having to separate it and the things that go into that. 
And even though that we the REF one cost is forty eight a ton, the REF two cost is sixty seven dollars a ton. Um, and I suspect that Commissioner Balache even pointed this out. That's with the jet. That's with the revenue that we generate. Th that's reflecting the capital costs of having to build these facilities, um, which in essence is also di diverting materials from what maybe could have been recycled as well, maybe on a much smaller scale, because I know we're pretty efficient at it, but I, I just don't understand how the 67 counties in Florida um, can embrace some of the technologies and options that we have, with one of them being recycling, and it, the cost that's associated with it, and the economies of scale that we get to capture as a large county. Yeah, that's correct. Um, th we do have a benefit of being a large county. Uh, back in 1975, you know, the, the municipalities and the county got together at the time and they realized they had the foresight to realize that the way that it was being done, solid waste management was being done in, in the 1970s was not sustainable and could not work with little landfills dotted all over the county. Um, so I, I give them the greatest amount of credit for having the foresight to develop an entity like the authority to be able to do these things on a large scale. Uh, we have interlocal agreements with 39 municipalities to provide uh, recycling support, to provide these systems. Um, I think we provide in incredible, as a result of our size, a very incredible value uh, given what you get for what you pay for. Um, the facilities we have are state of the art. A lot of other counties that are smaller, they rely more on the private sector. We're unique. We own our own RMPF. If you're a small community and you're shipping your glass, for example, to a distant uh, recycling facility and they're charging you a lot more than what your landfill cost is, it, it's very cost effective for them to make a decision to say, you know what, we're gonna stop doing that because we're not getting anything from it and it's not, and we know that it's, a lot of it's not actually going into the recycling markets. A lot of it is, is actually being landfilled as residue because they can't move it. And it's, it's easy for them to make a decision. It's an economical decision for them it, to, to make that decision because they have a direct immediate financial benefit associated with doing it. Um, the downside to what you talked about um, is that we were a big ship and we can't stop on a dime and we can't change direction as quickly as some others can in that case. But as a result of our size, we do have um, uh, some power in the market, in the commodities markets. There are people that want our material and there are people that look at our material as the premium material and when others can't move it, we're still able to move it. And I think what Willie said earlier was is the primary impact on the authority has been price. A lot of other communities out there, they're having issues moving material and it's piling up. Um, we don't have that problem. Um, if I had their problem, then we'd be sitting here talking about something else. Mm -hmm. um, but um, just, you know, we're doing okay here. We're looking for this market to rebound, um, but you are correct. Um, absent waste energy, absent uh, recy aggressive recycling programs, that 75% recycling goal is not achievable for most. Um, we're going to revert back to the, the system here that we have, so I'm going to recognize Commissioner Balache. Thank you. Just a couple questions, Dan. Um, so has there ever been a period in the recent past where we've actually come close to breaking even when commodity prices mm -hmm. were higher? Yes, um, breaking even from the standpoint of the just on your chart, you know, the the variable would be the you know the yes. revenue from yes, there has been in fact in the '90s there were a lot of times there were times in the early 2000s where you're roughly at break even between the the owning and operating cost of the recycling facility and the revenues, the collection cost is never it's never close to being covered. But our internally, what's in our disposal budget, there have been times where we actually have had higher revenue than expenses, yes. Okay, and two more questions. Thinking about large growing economies like China, is there an Indian market for recyclables? Yes, there is, and in fact, um, we are looking also at, at Latin American and South American markets as well. Um, the Indian market is there, um, Malaysia, uh, some other Southeast Asian, Vietnam, other Southeast Asian countries. It's important to note that they're having similar problems to what China had experienced. There are some unscrupulous uh, folks out there that are taking recyclables and they're just Stop throwing me. all kinds of junk in there, loading it in a container and shipping it across the ocean, 
And then these countries over there who don't have the disposal facilities we have, they've got the burden of dealing with, it, with excessive contamination. A lot of times it's electronics and other stuff that's been put into these. And I understand the issues that they have and the reason why they don't want to continue to operate under that, uh, under that type of uh, scenario. Um, that's what the industry is facing. Um, however, there are some positives coming, and um, the, the end of this presentation is really about what the outlook looks like and, and how we believe that's going to improve. Um, so, I mean, I'm going to ask with your... Well, uh, uh, Commissioner Weiss, you recognize, and then we'll move on. Thank you. Um, yeah, I just uh, just to and uh, for my uh, fellow board members, I mean, it, and I, I'm sure you've seen this. There was an article recently in the Guardian um, about recycling and about it being dumped in Vietnam and Malaysia and the impact it's having on uh, the the folks over there. And it's, I mean, it is horrendous. It really is. And uh, I I hope I hope that our materials are not ending up. In those uh, in those facilities, or they're not even facilities. It's in people's communities, and they're just be it's being dumped, and and it's uh, it's it, it would not any be anything anybody would be proud to have in their community. So I hope I hope our stuff is ending up in the right places and handled by the right people. But again, in that regard, and being a, a larger player in the market, I mean, there's quality controls that the, the, the brokers aren't just taking people at their word when th there's, there's got to be metrics that are met before products are accepted and paid for and shipped. Yeah, that's correct. And in, in fact, uh, last week, in fact, on a regular basis, um, representatives of these foreign countries that are importing this material are at our facility. They're randomly pulling bales. They're pulling the bales apart. They're making sure that what's inside them looks the same as what's on the outside of the bale. So there is that quality control process that takes place here. That's been ramped up significantly given uh, market situations. Um, it's a lot less likely now that material is going to get to Southeast Asia, at least from the authority, from our perspective, mm -hmm. um, because there are inspections that take place here and there are inspections that take place at the port before the material even goes out. So sure. there is and that quality control in place. Um, th th and that, that's important from an economic standpoint and a global partner standpoint, but are there Maybe this merits a discussion later on in the term on are there things that we should be doing as policymakers to ensure our actions are not hurting um, unfairly other countries, whether it's child labor, whether it's pollution to um, communities unfairly, um, trash dumping for uh, things that aren't recyclable. You know, we may be participating in those things either knowingly or unknowingly as a consumer, not as a government, but you know, when you go and buy products, whether it's a Nike, well, I won't name any brands, but whether it's a shoe or a diamond, there's a whole history and lineage of, of America's participation in suppressing other populations just by the consumer, well-intentioned consumer actions that we've taken. Maybe it's incumbent upon the Solid Waste Authority to look at reducing that, that potential impact to other countries and other populations. Yeah, and I think maybe we could, uh, you know, that's one thing, it's a good point, and maybe when we deal with the markets that we deal with and the brokers who we deal with, there may be a, uh, uh, some sort of a, and we'll have to do some research, a broker responsibility right. type of, of thing that we enter, enter into with them to ensure that our products are being uh, appropriately uh, marketed on their end once it right. gets. We're, we're a market, we're not just a government, we're participating in the market. Um, we're we're making revenues off things, and um, you know, I did read that article, and I've read other articles that, as I go about my daily life, I'm like, wow, this is some of the things that we intentionally do to other countries, and maybe are, we're not aware of it. So if we can maybe examine that later on, um, I think the board would probably appreciate that. Moving on, sorry, <laughs> Executive Director. No, that's okay, if, uh, really, if you can keep it moving, understood. Um, commissioners, many of you have mentioned that you've read articles. We're going to go into some of that real quick. But one thing to point out, too, is you talk about contamination and how is our material affecting others. Single stream that we didn't do is we're a dual stream community. Our contamination level is under 10%. So when you hear of dual stream, or I'm sorry, single stream communities having at least 20, 30, if not 40% contamination in their material, 
it makes it extremely hard, if you remember the first slide earlier, to reach a half a percent contamination for fiber. So, you know, we're kind of at the forefront and doing much better, as Mr. Pelowitz had said, with our material moving. So we're very proud of where we are and just keeping that contamination concept of single stream versus dual stream in perspective may help us through this as well. I'm, uh, I'm going to turn it over to Commissioner Weinrock, who has a question, and he'll take the gavel for a moment. Okay. Um, you know, c clearly we have a social cost of, of recycling, and I think that, you know, when we looked at the original slide of about $3 per, per month, I think that's probably tolerable, especially when we look at the offsetting cost of landfill if we went in a different direction. And I think that we're not taking into account the fact that the world has changed since that original 75% was set. I mean, if, if newsprint is going down, if water bottles are now thinner, obviously you should be getting a credit for what on the front end is not now being recycled because we've improved the way that we're dealing with our resources rather than pushing so much out there. So, you know, I, I think that this has really been very educational and it, it, it lays my fears that we are really wasting money on recycling, and I think ultimately the conversation is going to be going more to education of our residents to be better recyclers so that we can hit these goals of a half a percent on fiber, so that we, we're not walking around and seeing golf balls or, or bowling balls or other things put into these recycle bins that just shouldn't be there, that people think sometimes the more I put in there, the better I'm being as a recycler and not recognizing that they're just creating more problems by trying to be aggressive. So I, again, I think that this has been a very uh, important exercise in, it's in not understanding this, have this stream. Is bullying still a thing, Commissioner Weimar? <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> is, it, is it still a, no, it's a generational like, it's a gap here, but is it, a, is it still going on? People dumping bowling balls? <laughs> I see bowling balls in the morning. <laughs> I got to go down to Boca. <laughs> anyway, oh, continue. Um, uh, if you will, I'm just yes. going to, I'll push this through to the end. You want me to go to the final slides, the summary slides? Yeah, I'll just, um, yeah, go to the final slides, the summary slides. Um, you know, I think the industry's reaction, just quickly, there are some communities like we've talked about, they've cut individual materials, some have curtailed their programs. Overwhelmingly, they're staying the course. In your presentation, you'll see some examples of several communities and what they've done. Uh, you've seen a lot of headlines. They're kind of all over the place where recycling markets melt down. Um, you've got towns dumping their programs. The one headline you're not seeing is, is the overwhelming majority of communities that are continuing to do it. And Single stream. Uh, the single stream, there are some folks switching from single stream back to dual stream because they recognize that it, it's better. Um, the state of California, for example, is has a bill out to uh, change the law so the communities that adopt dual stream recycling are automatically compliant with their recycling requirements. So they're encouraging folks to go back to dual stream. Um, the benefit to dual stream, just in short, is you can see what's in the container when you pick it up. Um, that single stream container often, in, often turns into another garbage can. Um, and because they're generally collected with automated equipment, no one really sees what's inside them. And by the time that material gets to the facility, it's generally significantly more contaminated than what we produce. Um, future outlook is pretty good. Um, U.S. companies are investing in domestic capacity in the United States. Um, international companies are buying uh, U.S. mills. Uh, Nine Dragons is one, Shanying is another. They're buying U.S. mills. Their objective is they still need the material, but they want to be responsible on the front end for controlling the quality before it goes, it lands in their country. So that's really a good thing from their standpoint and from ours. Uh, new markets are emerging, but the challenges are similar. Um, as we've talked already, um, we are um, aggressively pursuing some opportunities in Central and South America. Um, so and we believe that, that has some promise. Uh, international companies are buying mills in the United are, are buying mills in the United States. Coca Cola, Nine Dragons, Grupo Gandhi, and Copamex, all investing in facilities to take this material and and produce uh, commodities from it. Uh, there is still a significant demand among uh, brands, major brands, to use recycled content. Um, you're looking at all of these brands right here. 
Um, they demand the material, their customers want it, and so that demand is going to be there. And as you've seen with the slides we showed you, on the plastic side, we actually do really well. Um, the real hardship in the market from a price standpoint now is with the fiber, uh, primarily mixed paper um, and those sort of commodities. Um, you'll see that we believe, and I, I think we all recognize that the public uh, has been educated over the years and generally strongly supports recycling. Uh, we believe they still do, and we believe that the cost um, is reasonable um, in the eyes of most people. Um, looking forward, um, there are some technologies that we can implement um, that could save money uh, on a processing side, on, from an, uh, a, a labor side on the processing side, and will produce higher quality. A lot of our uh, systems are a little uh, antiquated. Um, the board has already appropriated funds through previous budgets for the purpose of of upgrading some of these optical sorting systems, which can basically, they use optics to sense the colors and the densities of the various materials, and they can basically blow them off in one direction or another. So there is a lot more automated uh, opportunity there. Um, the new operator, um, that item is coming up before you, which SIMS has indicated a desire to look at these things. We haven't spent the money because the markets are kind of it's difficult to determine what the market's going to desire, and without knowing what the market uh, needs in terms of a contamination level, it's hard to decide what to invest in. And we knew we were going back out on the street for a new operator, and we'd rather have the impact input of the new operator and their buy-in to whatever uh, systems would be put in place. A cost-benefit analysis would need to be done to determine that, that it makes sense. And obviously, in this market, with the pricing where it is, you know, we've been hesitant to jump forward real quickly with a major capital investment, uh, not knowing where things are going. Commissioner Bauchet, you recognize, sir. Um, thank you, Dan. Two questions. One, is there any opportunity to do direct business with Niagara, who is a very huge bottler at the Park of Commerce? Um, it's funny you, you mentioned that. We have talked internally about the value of establishing a direct relationship with a mill or, or even with a, with, a, with a foreign country or some entity on a, um, a contractual basis with floors and ceiling pricing that enables us to move our material specifically to a market that wants it. Um, the downside of that is obviously you lose the benefit of competition in really good markets, um, and you don't want to cut everybody out because you're putting all your eggs in one basket. But, yeah, there is a benefit to um, dealing directly with uh, one or more of these companies, and we will certainly um, take a look at that okay. if, if the board and desires. We the other thing, medium to long term, China needs this material, and it seems like they've added these very stringent requirements to shock the market into better compliance. Is the forecast for, you know, eventually that 0.5% that uh, contamination level to be eased somewhat and that they start taking more material and paying more for it? I, I do believe that over the longer term that these problems are going to be alleviated. I think that these developing markets need this material as feedstock um, for their own industries. And I do believe that those of us who can do it well and produce a very clean product do have some opportunities in the market for, I believe, direct relationships with, with some other uh, folks out there who use this material in, the, in their role in the circular economy and getting it back into commerce, yes. Okay, thanks. So just getting to the takeaways right now, our commodities are moving. Um, our mandate does, admission does include recycling. We provide that service countywide. Um, markets are challenging currently. We believe they're going to improve. Uh, we have a very successful and established program, um, and um, it's been very beneficial to the authority in terms of consuming landfill, conserving landfill space, um, but it also does have the, those other intrinsic benefits that recycling has, is, which is the reason why we entered into it to begin with. It was, it was not a, a, a cost objective. It was more of an environmental and resource um, conservation uh, uh, impetus. Um, our impact has not been uh, disruption in the flow of material. It has been price-related, which is better than a lot of folks have seen. Uh, but we need to be prepared for a market turnaround. We believe one is going to happen, and we need to be uh, more efficient and more cost-effective, and we need to produce the cleanest product we possibly can to ensure the future viability of this program.
with that, that concludes the presentation. Thank you. Well, fortunately, in the interest of efficiency, we inserted our questions throughout the entirety of this presentation. But if there are any follow-up questions, I would be happy to entertain those. I don't see any lights. Um, any closing comments or thoughts on this presentation? I, I found it to be exceptionally um, helpful and exceptionally complex. And I think we're, we're in a lucky position to have the resource, resources that we have. I know it's a big ship, but our only issue is that recycling prices are affected. I think there's probably several jurisdictions that can't even move their product at certain times. And um, you know, thank you for the great job that you're doing. I mean, some of the issues that we're talking about today are on this agenda as well. So uh, thank you for bringing that up, Commissioner Weinroth. I think we're all fully committed to the aspirational goal of recycling. And if there are things that can be done market-wise or other um, from a moral standpoint, we'll look at those. But um, I think our, our taxpayers and our constituents are happy to bear a, a small burden to help the environment. And um, yeah, we'll move on. All right. <clears throat> item, agenda item 9A2, Interlocal Agreement for Inspector General Services. Is there a presentation that's needed? Uh, no, this is an interlocal agreement with the Inspector General's office. Um, it's a three-year renewal has come up. We have a contract with the Inspector General uh, for IG services. As we should. So moved. We have a motion by Commissioner Weinroth, seconded by Commissioner Weiss, uh, 9A2 to authorize the Executive Director to enter an interlocal agreement for Inspector General services for three-year term effective October 1, 19. Uh, all in f any discussion, all in favor, all opposed, the item carries six to zero. 9B, legal counsel. Nothing to report. That's good. 9C, operations, field services, and utilities. Mr. Ironton. No items. Okay. Agenda item 9D, new business, customer information services. Mr. Archambo. Yeah, yeah, he has none. Mr. Archambo is at the COBRA meeting doing a presentation right. as we speak. It's unfortunate that we can't be at COBRA today, but we have to be here. Right? <laughs> um, 9E, Engineering and Construction Services. Mr. Kari. Yes, uh, item 91, <coughs> excuse me, item 91 is uh, uh, the lease agreement for Horizon to locate a private equestrian waste facility. This was before the board in February. The board approved it and uh, directed staff to negotiate. Uh, we've finalized the lease, and um, uh, they're going to be paying us $14,100 per year per acre uh, for uh, the lease agreement. And it's been reviewed by our general counsel. I have no comment cards. I have no inquiries from my colleagues. Is there a motion? Motion, motion by Commissioner McKinley, second by Commissioner Berger. All in favor, all opposed, 9E1 carries 6 to 0 with Mayor Bernard absent. On to 9E2. Item, item 9E2 is the O&M agreement for uh, uh, the RMPF. Uh, we, we issued an RFP 19-206. We received three proposals, um, SIMS Recycling, Ferrovial, and Atlantic Fibers. And SIMS was uh, ranked the highest uh, proposer. And um, they would be starting the contract once approved by the board on 1st of October. Is Mr. Oberter Bridge available? You know, after that presentation, I don't know that we should move forward at this point. <laughs> I mean, your comment card says we are pleased to be selected, but I, we may need to reconsider. Uh, and of course, I'm just joking. Please, uh, if you'd like to make some public comments on agenda item 92, you're recognized for three minutes, sir. Uh, good morning. I just very briefly am um, here to um, say we're very, well, we were very excited when the RFP came out and to put a proposal together for uh, operating this facility, and we're obviously more excited and pleased to have been selected by your selection committee. Um, and so, assuming that you go ahead with a vote of approval today, uh, we look forward to working with SWA and the county. Um, you heard this morning, it's definitely a very difficult time in the recycling industry. 
Uh, we've been in the business for 100 years and we are fully committed to it um, and, uh, and to basically dealing with the situation as it is today and doing everything we can to be as efficient as possible to make sure that, um, that yeah, we, we, we minimize, the, uh, minimize the downside and, uh, and take advantage of the opportunities that there are. As you think if you heard, there's a number of things that, that can be done, a number of things that are happening, and certainly we believe in the future of it. So uh, um, we hope to get your vote of approval today and look forward to working with you in the future. Thank you for those comments, sir. Commissioner Weiss, you're recognized. Yeah, thank you. Um, one of the uh, things we've heard about our recycling uh, facility in the past has been the turnover there, and that was due to wages. Uh, I, it was one of the reasons it was given to us was the, the wages. Uh, what's the plan for the wages f uh, for under the up upcoming contract? Uh, the RFP spelled out, uh, I, I guess, compliance with the living wage ordinance. So. Um, certainly the lowest paid worker meets that, uh, that wage rate, which hopefully is enough to um, uh, minimize that turnover. Uh, and then people with uh, greater skill levels uh, go up from that rate, $2.71. Um, I mean, excuse me, twelve seventy an hour. Um, certainly we do everything in in our business where we operate, we try to, to the extent that there is opportunity to, for people to, to be trained and to move up, uh, we have a high degree of retention just because we try to make sure our, to the extent that we can make the work environment one where people want to be in, just in terms of working conditions. I mean, there's, there are limited things you're doing. It is a, a lot of it is manual work. Um, but certainly we try to do things within our operation and with our HR department to, to sort of optimize the environment, um, respecting people, making sure they have the proper safety equipment, making sure the work conditions are as, as, as good as they can be. Um, and then certainly that, that living wage minimum, I think, should help a great deal. We have a full benefits package, so to the extent that we're competing with other people who are at that, at that rate, hopefully we can, um, yeah, we, can, we can make an attractive place to stay. And um, the, you know the living wage that that we impose as policymakers on our contractors is a is a ultimately a burden borne by our taxpayers on the county side and the assessment payers here. Um, today we just took action to ensure that everyone at the authority internally is paid fifteen dollars an hour and also at the county. Um, our taxpayers allow us to do that. You're in the you're in the business of profit making, um, but we've now set a floor that every competitor that you have would have to meet when you insert or bid for that proposal. And I think that our constituents allow us to do that and I'm proud of it. So having said that, oh, we have a Commissioner we Weiss has already been recognized. Commissioner McKinley, you're recognized. I just have a question for staff. Um, being born in New York, certainly support New York companies, but I'm curious, were there no local companies that were eligible for this RFP? Um, there were no local companies. All three responders were outside Palm Beach County. Okay, thanks. All right. Normally, you should feel very safe um, being selected. We've had occasions where we've changed our mind, but I'm waiting for a motion here, and we'll move on. Move we have a motion by Commissioner Weiss, seconded by Commissioner McKinley. All in favor? All opposed? What's that? He didn't bring the mother. <laughs> Don't bring the mother. Um, agenda item passes six to zero. <laughs> Commissioner Bernard, um, absent. Thank you, Thank and you. Uh, we look forward to visiting um, and seeing you guys in action. I mean, absolutely. Which we will do that. Agenda item nine e three. Palm uh, Beach item Re item nine e three is the site licensing agreement between the <coughs> authority and uh, Cavanta Metals Marketing for an eight month pilot program uh, to recover metals and aggregate from uh, the authority's uh, waste, energy, ash. The authority produces about 350,000 tons of ash uh, post-processing um, all the municipal solid waste, and this ash currently is being disposed of in the landfill. So we're exploring other opportunities to beneficially use ash and uh, derive aggregate from it and put it to use in uh, road base and asphalt and concrete. So this is the first Sorry. project we're undertaking um, to make sure that uh, we get some data and uh, Cavanta uh, proposed on this project, and they are the operator for the waste energy plants. 
And in fact, we do have an approval from DEP for this pilot project. Um, on Monday, we received this approval. Sure. So they are going to be processing 78,000 tons of ash on top of Class 1 line landfill. And Move they'll to be approve. paying us 31 cents per ton. <coughs> now, that we're, we're excited about this. We've all been briefed on it and in detail. And I, I guess you're passing around some exhibits here. Um, this is what's being produced. That those are samples of what samples. can be produced. Right. Um, those the two vials have the ferrous and non-ferrous metals, very small fractions are being recovered from the ash, and that um, hunk of concrete there is is made with uh, aggregate recovered from ash, as part of our uh, the analysis we've been doing with the University of Florida to uh, seek widespread approval for the use of this material. Commissioner Weiss, you recognized. Oh, Commissioner McKinley, you recognized. Where are we with FDOT authorizing use of this product? Uh, we're going to be uh, working with FDOT uh, very soon. Uh, FDEP issued a notice of intent, mm -hmm. and the 30-day time clock expires 7th of July. You know, once we get the approval, we're going to have discussions with DOT. Uh, this won't be the first discussion. We had like three or four meetings up in Gainesville with their testing labs, and uh, they're fully aware of uh, you know our uh, approach on this thing and. Uh, they need to provide us a spec for approval for use in Palm Beach County. Mm -hmm. And we also had discussions with um, uh, the county engineer, Mr. Ricks, and so they can use uh, the aggregate derived from this on county projects so it saves money for them. But it's still a long process, you know, I mean, they won't initiate anything until DOT provides uh, an approved spec for use uh, in, on county projects. If I thought the county, um, the county followed the same regulations as DOT, we don't have separate regulations. Of correct. That's correct. You know, I mean, it, it flows down from the state level. Um, they have standard specifications for each and every uh, um, material mm -hmm. that goes into a road base or bridge construction or concrete. So we're going to get uh, a conditional spec for use uh, in Palm Beach County. And uh, once that's been approved, you know, it's a few months down the road. You know, it's a work in progress. And once that's there, the aggregate that we make from ash um, you know, it's, it's, it's free for any private entity to use. So they're, I mean, they can use up to 30% of this material um, in construction. So they can bring in their bids that much lower. So it saves money for them. They make a little more money and for the county to get uh, reusable material. And, um, you know, overall it's a win-win. And are we working with any other uh, construction industries? Uh, you know, the, the school district, home builders associations, because that would actually be a really cool polished floor. Um, uh, correct. You know, I mean, again, you know, once once we get the approval from uh, DEP and DOT, you know, we're going to start the discussions, you know, full time. Uh, we already met with CMEX. We met with Ranger Construction, um, OHL, Community Asphalt, and uh, other construction entities, private guys. And um, so we're going to further this along. But the, the other industry wouldn't be DOT. So like the it won't be DOT, the but they would... Correct. You know, they would still need a DEP approval from uh, a safety and um, environmental perspective. Okay. It sounds like this is this is sort of a new. We're breaking new ground here. Yeah. And there are other entities that have done this thing before um, here in our country. You know, there's very few entities that do this thing, if not Correct. anyone. So, uh, but in Europe, it's more prevalent. You know, they use this all the time. Commissioner Weiss, you recognize, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, yeah, the, I guess my point was is, is, and I just read an article in the NACO uh, newspaper about an operate in, in Spokane, I believe, and they've got a waste energy facility. They've been very successful in uh, their, so they're using their ash in the aggregate. They're also using, uh, doing the rec reclamation of the ferrous and non-ferrous metals um, in their facility as well. And the, in the article that I read, it. It, uh, it, they sang the successes of the program in, uh, in helping to eliminate um, the ash having to go to uh, disposal. Um, they also talked, there also was another article talking about the crushed glass going into roadways as well. And I think in New York, it's, um, it's not uncommon to use that as, as part of the aggregate as well. So maybe there's something there for, for the glass as well. Well, this is, this an is also another. Uh, uh, it's also another revenue stream. You know, when they make the aggregate, you know, they also get all these precious metals. Uh, you know, aluminum, copper, and sometimes gold and platinum too. And that's another revenue stream. It's it not only um, has outlets for the aggregate, but it's also another revenue generator. And the county government's a big purchaser of roads, and 
It's like a self-fulfilling prophecy. Anyways, we have a, a, a motion by Commissioner Weiss, a second by Commissioner Weinroff. Is there any discussion, further discussion by my colleagues? Was there any other information on this item that you wanted to present to us, sir? I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, no, I'm done, thank you. Okay, um, so motion's been made and seconded. All in favor, all opposed, the item carries six to zero. And that's on nine, three. Moving on to F, planning and environmental programs. Mary Beth Morrison, ma'am, you're recognized. Okay, thank you. Um, the next item on the agenda is to approve the renewal of the operation permit for Atlas Peat and Soil, which processes a, a yard trash recycling facility. Um, if you recall, at the February board meeting, this permit was up for renewal, and they faced some uh, items of noncompliance, which dealt with fire code and site code issues. Uh, it was pile heights, road access roads, landscaping, and some unpermitted containers. Since that time, the facility has gotten back into compliance with all the fire code issues. There are still two outstanding items with Palm Beach County Code enforcement. They were granted an extension uh, for April 22nd, but the facility failed to meet that deadline. They are facing the uh, special magistrate hearing on July 10th. With all that information, uh, the authority sent the permittee a compliance assistance letter, and we did receive a response of what their plan is to get back into compliance. If they cannot get the uh, containers permitted, they will remove them. They've hired a consultant to assist them assist them with this effort. Uh, so mm -hmm. based on all that information, we are recommending uh, a permit uh, be renewed until October 31st of 2019 to get the facility back into compliance, and then we can take it from there. Uh, is there a representative from Atlas Peat and Soil here today? They were informed of the board meeting, um, but I guess they are not here. But based upon your recommendation, this is a sort of a temporary extension or re renewal of the permit only until October 31st? Correct. And then what happens at that time? Uh, we're hoping that the facility will get back into compliance with the code issues. Uh, we've been doing monthly visits, and they have been maintaining the other solid waste issues, the pile heights, the road access roads. Um, if they s resolve it with the code uh, department, then we can give them a renewal for a year. If they fall short, we can uh, move into our own level of enforcement. In Rule 1, Mr. Pelowitz could get into uh, a letter of not, uh, a violation, consent agreements. If, again, they fail to comply, it can get kicked up to um, the Palm Beach County Health Department and the, um, the control board. Hopefully we won't get there. Um, our goal is to kind of assist this facility to stay in compliance. They handle a lot of yard trash, which also helps our recycling goal sure. for the county. So it's, it's a delicate balance. Yeah, we want, we want them to get into compliance and succeed. Um, any concerns from council on this temporary extension? No, not at this point. Okay. Um, all right. Colleagues, is there a motion? Anybody want to move? So moved. Okay. Commissioner Weinroth has made a motion to um, approve agenda item F1, seconded by Commissioner Weiss. Commissioner McKinley, you're recognized in discussion. Um, I it went from being too loud to being too quiet. This is similar in my mind to what we went through in Pahokee. Uh, with a similar operator out there, and so I would, uh, I would tell you that if you bring this back to us at the expiration of this extension, and they have not resolved their code enforcement issues, I will not support further extension. So it probably would be in Atlas's best interest to actually show up at the meeting and have this conversation <coughs> with us. How many extensions have we given them? They received this permit originally in 2014. Um, this is their third renewal in those different renewal process. Uh, two out of those times we've been doing um, extensions based on non-compliance issues. And how long have they been in active code enforcement violations? Since uh, this last round for code. It's been, I guess, before February. 
so a couple of months. Okay, thank you. Is it related at all of these code violations to the larger, the overarching issue of the landscape services that the county's dealing with? Or you may not even know about that. If you did, it'd be weird. No, um, it's they have uh, two containers that they subleased that or a leasee came in to lease out the property and they're not rated or permitted. So they would just have to either remove them or make sure that they meet the standards. They, they look like a tractor trailer container that another entity is using for storage. Right. So um, the items should be easy Time to address, to um, you know, but it's just we got to get them in compliance. And the non-renewal of a operation permit council, is there, are there due process concerns about property rights in that permit that we should not be discussing issues of its revocation besides what's before us today? Uh, Dan can probably better address those at the moment. I have looked at them in the past, would need to look at them again, but yes, there is a whole process involved in doing it and we would need to comply with it. All right. So. You know, it, in the spirit of what Commissioner McKinley was speaking about, as you interact with them, it, it would be helpful to the conversation if they would be here to help um, give perspective to this process that they're going through. And of course, we'll make an ultimate decision um, on the permit renewal after October 31st. Commission's <coughs> or the, uh, motion has been made by Commissioner Weinroth, seconded by Commissioner Weiss. All in favor, all opposed. Uh, 9F1 passes 6 to 0. New business, financial management and services. Mr. DeMars. None at this time. None other. I think we've, we've done enough. You've done enough for us today <laughs> on the budget. Uh, item 10, other scheduled matters. I don't see any. Uh, item 11, comments by general counsel. No comments. Item 12, comments by authority staff. None. Thank you. Item 13, comments by the board. I'll start with Commissioner Weinroth, the vice chair. I have no comments, thank you. Commissioner Greg Weiss, our secretary. No comments. Commissioner Hal Valache. None. Commissioner Mary Lou Berger. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to uh, give a quick apology to the staff and to my colleagues on being late this morning, but when you uh, turn the key and it's dead as a doorknob, you know you're in trouble. But thank goodness uh, AAA was able to get to me within 20 minutes, which I right. thought was really good. So again, my apologies, <coughs> and I'm glad I was able to at least get to part of the meeting. No, no problem at all. And I wanted to tell you that um, in the short time that you weren't here, we did have a, a good discussion on the budget since I don't want to talk about it behind closed doors with you, but I don't want you to have to watch the whole meeting unless you want to. You probably will, knowing you. I, I actually had the meeting on <laughs> and was watching it while the guy was changing the battery. Of course you did. I and heard so the vote <laughs> and I saw, the, I saw everything. And you know that we'll t discuss um, the, the blighted grant issue at, at the next uh, meeting as well. Um, so, uh, Mayor Mac Bernard is absent. I have no comments except to say thank you for all your hard work. It's uh, always been a pleasure to serve as chair of the governing board and I look forward to our next meeting on Wednesday, August 28th. Before you adjourn the meeting, can you call on me for comments? <laughs> <laughs> You're so quiet over there. I can, and I will, and I must. <laughs> I apologize. Thank you, Commissioner Berger. Since uh, he, he uh, keeps forgetting about me way down here at the end, I make sure you notice that he is drinking out of a Florida State University yeah. cereal cup. <laughs> Uh, I'd like to make a motion to appoint Raymond Mayor to the Citizens Advisory Committee. Second. A motion by Commissioner McKinley to appoint the Mayor to the Advisory Committee, second by Commissioner Weinroth. All in favor, all opposed, congratulations to the Mayor. Any other comments, ma'am? Um, it's just my name is Melissa McKinley. I'm a County <laughs> Commissioner from District 6, and it's nice to meet you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, in, the, uh, in the unlikely event that I'm not present at the August 28th, 2019 regular meeting, um, I would like to say that it has been an honor to serve as the chair, um, and it's been an honor to work with everybody on this uh, authority, and I'm proud of the work that you guys do, and I'm proud of the work that a colleague, my colleagues do, including Commissioner Kinley. Uh, having said that, this meeting is adjourned. Thank you.